Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're talking about owls. Where did these mysterious birds come from, and why did they stay up at night? Everyone knows the owls came here to party, and the best parties are at night. <laughs> to find the real answer, we'll learn about a tree that contains every bird species that's ever lived, and discover how bird scientists created it. This is going to be a hoot. Brayden and Giselle are two Tumble listeners who both sent us questions about owls, and they both told us what they thought the answers to their questions might be. Let's listen. Hi, my name is Brayden. I'm 10 years old, and my question is, what is the origin of owls? Are new species of owls still bred? I think the origin of owls is that humans got two kinds of birds and bred them until the owl was born. I'm Giselle Reyes and I'm nine years old and from Texas. My question is why do owls sleep in the morning and wake up at night? I think it might be because prey and predators are asleep so they can catch their prey and be sick from predators. And I just want to say that I'm such a big fan of Temple. Thank you, Marshall and Lindsay. Oh, thanks, Giselle. <laughs> That's so sweet. These are both great questions about owls who are known for being mysterious birds. So let's ask our listeners to come up with their own answers to these questions. What is the origin of owls, and are new owls still emerging? And why do owls sleep in the morning and wake up at night? And how do you think scientists might find out the answers to these questions? Think about it. Okay, so you got your ideas together? Feel free to pause the podcast if you're still thinking. We have an awesome ornithologist, a bird scientist, to guide us on our journey of owl discovery. Scott Edwards studied the evolution and biology of birds. And to answer Brayden and Giselle's question, he first looked at a picture. I'm looking at a picture of this genealogical tree. What's that? What's a genealogical tree? It's a fancy word for a family tree. Well, like the kind that shows how you're related to your family. Exactly. But Scott's looking at the bird family tree. It tracks all the species of birds back for tens of millions of years. And yes, that tree shows that owls, they go back a long way. They go back almost 65 million years ago, almost at the time of that asteroid. Wait, what? Like, what asteroid is he talking about? He's talking about the asteroid that killed almost all of the dinosaurs. What do you mean, almost all? Dinosaurs didn't actually go extinct. They, in fact, the birds, all the birds are still with us today, and they're thought to be descended from dinosaurs. So you're telling me that the story of owls goes all the way back to the dinosaurs? Yes. So I did not expect that. <laughs> You might also be surprised that dinosaur times have a lot to do with why owls are nocturnal. What? Many of the dinosaurs were diurnal. They're, you know, cold-blooded, meaning they can't really regulate their temperature. So they have to be out during the day when it's warm, just like uh, modern lizards today. Because dinosaurs could only be up while the sun was up, mammals, a.k.a. dinosaur food, figured out that it was safer for them to be up while dinosaurs were asleep. They naturally became nocturnal so as not to compete with the dinosaurs. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. If there are giant T-Rexes roaming around, you definitely don't want to be out while they're out. <laughs> then, when an asteroid hit the Earth, mammals weren't just dinosaur food items. They diversified into new species to fill the spaces where dinosaurs used to be. But the species that owls like to eat... Things like small rodents and mice and shrews... ...stayed nocturnal. So that's a long story to sort of help you figure out why it is that owls are nocturnal. And it's mostly because a lot of their prey is nocturnal. So let me see if I got this right. So mammals became nocturnal to stay away from dinosaur mealtimes. Then owls came along, and because they're super wise, figured out that there was a free-flowing mammal buffet at night... And then they became nocturnal to catch it. 
Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> but how do we know that? Like, how did scientists draw that bird family tree and put owls 65 million years back? And how do we know that they've been nocturnal all along? Well, this is where it gets really interesting. And it starts with the grandfather of evolution, Charles Darwin. Darwin believed that all organisms had a common ancestor, meaning at one point they were all one species. So there was like one great, great, great grandparent animal. Exactly. The start of the entire family tree of all animal life. Through adapting to different environments, organisms can evolve in new ways and, and change over time. Over a lot of time, these organisms become so different that they can't breed together anymore. They split uh, from one species into two species. And scientists call that uh, process the process of speciation. That's how one species can uh, diversify into two. So that's how you get like all the different kinds of birds there are in the bird family tree. Yeah, it's not like, did one bird have a baby with another type of bird? But speciation is a long and natural process. And I'm assuming the birds don't have like a birdancestry.com where they can look up their ancestors and be like, oh, I got someone who came over on the asteroid. <laughs> came over on the asteroid? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> are you talking about alien birds? <laughs> There's probably some. <laughs> no, 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 there are not. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely would explain macaws. <laughs> macaws. So how do scientists create this tree? They developed a couple of different techniques. The first is getting clues in DNA. These days, we can use the DNA in the cells of living organisms to figure out how different species are related to each other. Scientists read DNA, or the genetic code of each animal, as a long series of letters. They take DNA from different bird species and compare their letters to each other. Closely related species will have very small difference in the sequence of their DNA and the DNA letters, whereas distantly related species, ones that came from an ancestor a long time ago, they will have lots and lots of differences in the DNA letters in their cells. Yeah, so the more similar the letters are, the more recently the birds became different species. Exactly. So who are owls most related to? Who are, who are their cousins? We think that eagles and possibly uh, vultures may have been relatives of owls. Okay, so other predatory birds with like big claws and screeching cries. Uh, that makes sense. <laughs> so if there are a lot of different species of owls now, who was the common ancestor, like the great grandma owl? And how do we know that she was nocturnal? That's a really good question. There's now around 200 species of owls and they all have one common ancestor. So let's zoom into that bird family tree and draw an owl family tree off of it. At the base of our owl tree, we've got the single common ancestral owl species. That owl species diverged into two. So that trunk with the original granddaddy and grandmama owl splits into two, leading to two branches. And if you can imagine that both sets of species have some trait in common. Like in the case of owls, if both are nocturnal, we can make a pretty strong inference that the common ancestor also had that condition. So wait, what does he mean by an inference? It's the science word for making a conclusion based on an observation. Okay, so they can assume that if both the related owls are nocturnal, then the ancient owl was probably nocturnal too. But if we weren't there to watch ancient owls hunt, how do we know that they did it at night? Well, that's the second technique. Scientists also look at owl fossils. Oh, and if they find them at night, that means... <laughs> <laughs> that makes perfect sense. <laughs> no, no, no. When we see a fossil that has traits that are similar between it and owls today, that's another indication that the common ancestor of owls probably had that trait as well. Okay, so they're like, if today's owls look like this and do that, and ancient owls also look like this, they probably also did that. 
Yeah, and owl fossils do provide some pretty strong clues that owls have been night owls for a long time. I see what you did there. First of all, owls have very, very big eyes. You could imagine why an owl would have very big eyes. I mean, because it makes them look smarter, like they're wearing a little pair of glasses. (laughs) No, they're using them to see at night. (laughs) He needs big eyes to capture as much light as possible. So owls actually see night as being brighter than we do? Yeah, their night vision is amazing. To hold those big eyes, they have these bony rings in their eyes called sclerotic rings. That's a complicated word, sclerotic rings, but... Basically, it's a ring of bones that help anchor the eye uh, in the skull. These eye socket rings are found in the fossils of ancient owls as well. We think it's a reasonable assumption to infer that if nocturnal owls today have large eyes, then it's likely that fossil owls did as well. So that's, that's one powerful way by which we can infer behaviors that we haven't directly seen. Okay, so I think I'm really getting the bird family tree and the fossil connection. So basically, scientists are putting fossils on this branch all the way back to when great grandma owl split off from her common ancestor with other birds. Well, not exactly. Wait, what? There's a big empty space at the beginning of the owl branch. It's pretty blank. You know, I'm looking, I'm just looking around to see. We have owls going back um, almost 50 million years, and yet. They look like modern owls. That's the case with a lot of of bird groups, I would say. Wait, so we don't have ancient bird fossils? But somehow, through some sort of science magic, we know that they branch off like 65 million years ago? Yes, and this is the final technique to help make the bird family tree, a time machine. We use a tool called a molecular clock Wait, oh, well, you know, why didn't you mention that at the beginning? They just climb into the time machine and then go back and they're like, oh, look, owls, 65 million years ago. No, no, a molecular clock is not a time machine. You can like shrink yourself down into a molecule and climb into. What it does do is allow scientists to turn back time through DNA. That's a very powerful way for figuring out when two species might have diverged, even when we don't have fossils directly linking those two species. So this sounds crazy. Like, so how does it work? The molecular clock combines the two techniques we just talked about, DNA and fossils. It puts them together into an equation that figures out how fast species might have changed between these two fossil examples. So like to figure out how long a second is on the clock. Yeah, or like how many millions of years on the clock. And once they know that, they can tick back the clock on all kinds of different bird species and find out when they branched off on that tree. We're able to essentially determine or at least estimate when two groups of species might have diverged. Wow, that's so clever. In this way, scientists could complete the bird family tree and find owl's place on it. So given that it's been all this work to figure it out, I'm assuming we humans didn't get to breed owls for their round heads and lack of necks and stunning eyesight and hearing. No, and it turns out owls are only bred in captivity to like help keep their species alive if they're endangered. I would say owls in general are not, um, they're not a popular species for keeping among humans. Well, muggles, of course not. <laughs> but owls are popular among wizards. <laughs> I actually asked Scott my own owl question, which is, can owls deliver letters and packages tied to their legs? <laughs> <laughs> I have never heard of that. There may be some cultures that uh, that do that, but I've never heard of uh, an owl you know, returning in the same way like an eagle would. I can't believe he's never heard of Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> Scientists will have to study enchanted owls next. <laughs> Try making your own bird family tree. Check out the image that scientists created of the bird family tree on our website, and then make your own version using all of your creative talents. How can you show the connections between bird species and when they evolved? Get artistic. We'd love to see what you make.
Thanks to Dr. Scott Edwards, professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard University and curator of ornithology at Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology. An extra special thanks to Brayden and Giselle for sending in their excellent questions, answers, and high-quality recordings. Listeners, you can send your questions to us at tumblepodcast at gmail.com. Learn more about owls and the bird family tree in our bonus interview episode with Scott Edwards. It's available to patrons who pledge $1 or more a month on patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. See the actual bird family tree and get more educational resources on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. Claire Glendening is our intern. Sarah Robertson Lentz is our head of partnerships and designed our episode art. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote and produced this show. And I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and join us next time for more stories of science discovery. Science discovery.